Hi guys, in this video I will show you how to implement a special case of functions in assembly, uh, so-called leaf functions. These are functions that do not call other functions. And before I show you the gory details in a demo, let me give you an idea why we use this term leaf from botany uh, for describing this special case of functions. In the C programming part of this lecture, we are already using functions. That means we actually already know what we're talking about. And it also means that you know that these flowcharts that were used for describing the control flow of if statements and loops cannot be used for describing the control flow of programs that use functions. Because when a function returns, it returns to a return address. And this return address depends on where the function was called. But what you can do is you can describe certain dependencies in a, a call graph. Who is calling who? And in this simple example, it seems like we just have two functions, function main and function printf. And then uh, we can express in this graph that at a certain point of time, function main calls function printf. And uh, we also can say in this situation, function main is the caller and function printf the callee, the called function. And with this uh, graphs, um, this term actually makes sense because in this case we have a simple graph, a special uh, case of a graph where we have a tree structure. And in a tree, uh, certain nodes do have charts or not. And if they do not have charts, uh, actually they're called leaves of this tree. So in this graph, printf would be a leaf node and uh, because it's a core graph uh, leaf function. Now, technically, this is, of course, not correct because we know printf is a function from the standard library, which internally calls other functions, for example, put s. Um, to be also technically correct, uh, just change it uh, to that example where foobar is, is certainly not calling other functions. And so here we really just have one leaf function. To give you an idea that this in general really might sometimes look like a tree, um, let's change it to uh, this example uh, where we have two function calls in main. So uh, this more looks like a tree just uh, upside down. So here uh, we have two leaves in this tree. Let me also give you an idea why uh, it might be not just technically more complicated to uh, implement functions that can call other functions, but also harder to talk about certain things. Uh, this rows of caller and callee, because this rows uh, in general change. Like in this example, where main first is the caller of the uh, callee bar. And um, that means at a certain point of time, bar is the callee, but then the callee becomes the caller. And so uh, you always have to mention at what point of time are you describing certain things. Let me also uh, show you in a last example why these call graphs are in general, of course, not tree structures. For example, if you have recursive function calls, then uh, this is certainly not a tree. But still, we would say here this uh, node printf is a leaf node, and you would uh, say that printf in this case uh, is uh, considered to be a leaf function. Let me first make a copy of this instruction set that we used in the last session so that I just can um, add a few more instructions that are needed here. And uh, this will be added to here. Uh, first, I actually just add an instruction that makes it easier for me to show you that a certain function was actually called. I just want to print a few characters, uh, basically a, a simple way to write a string. So far, we just have this instruction, which prints the content of a register. So that would mean that I first have to write uh, some Asking code into a register and then print it from there. And that's kind of inconvenient for this uh, demo. So let's copy this and let's modify it. So uh, with this new, new opcode, I'm having a new instruction for printing a character, but I want to print the immediate value uh, sp uh, specified by this expression so that I can, for example, use a character uh, literal. And also in this implementation, I now just use this immediate value or the expression uh, specified. 
Okay, now let's first regenerate um, the computer architecture. And up here, I can show you how to use this new instruction. I can now just use put C together with some character literal. And with that, I have a simple way to print some strings. Let's say foo followed by some new line. And then also some halt instructions so that we uh, have a simple program uh, for printing a string. And now I can show you how to implement the instruction for doing this um, function calls. Two things need to be done. Uh, we have to jump to a certain destination address and we also need to obtain the return address, the address of the uh, instruction that follows this uh, function call. And for that, the microarchitecture provides this function ulm underscore apps jump. Uh, part of the control unit uh, is providing that. With uh, two parameters, the first is a 64 bit value with the destination address. And the second is a register, uh, some 8 bits identifying a register. So let's call this parameter red for return uh, register. Internally, it works as follows. The address of the instruction that follows is the value of the instruction pointer plus 4, because every instruction has 4 bytes. And this um, value, instruction pointer plus 4, will be stored first in this return. Uh, register and after that the instruction pointer gets overwritten with this 64 bits from the destination address. Now of course I need a new opcode and uh, instruction format but let me first show you how I want to use this in assembly notation later. Uh, let's use the mnemonic uh, jump and the um, destination address will be stored in a uh, register where I can store 64 bits. So kind of convenient. And the return address in some different register. So of course I need a new opcode and I can use this instruction format. And then the implementation simply calls this ulm apps jump micro instruction with um, the value stored in register x. So ulm rec val x and the return address should be stored in register y. So that's it. Now I can rebuild the computer architecture down here and up here I can show you how this can be used for function calls. Every function will be simply a label followed by a block of instructions. So uh, this here will be a function uh, with a uh, function name foo and um, before I show you how uh, we have to change this last instruction function foo, this old instruction to a instruction to uh, return to the return address. Let me show you how to call this function. I first store the address of a function. Uh, that means the label in a register. And in this case, 16 bits uh, will be sufficient. So I can use this uh, load instruction uh, for storing uh, 16 bits in a zero extended 16 bits in a quad uh, register and I want to store the address foo there. And in general this will not work because a label uh, in general requires up to 64 bits. But uh, you will see on the website how to do, generalize this. For our examples it's uh, most of the time sufficient. And after that is done I can use this jump instruction to jump to the address stored in register 1 and the return address should be stored in register 2. And after the function call, when the function returns, I want to hold the program. So this will be the main program. Now, of course, this will uh, currently not work. We will jump to function foo, but then in the end it holds the program. Uh, this, of course, needs to be changed. We have to jump to the return address. How does that work? Right, we jump to the address stored in register 2 and here we actually do not have to uh, care about any return address so we store the return address in register 0. 
And of course, this uh, shows you already that caller and callee somehow have to agree on certain conventions to, uh, to some kind of protocol. And this protocol later will be extended so that we also can pass parameters to a function. A function can somehow use local uh, variables by using certain registers and can leave behind some return value in some uh, particular register. But let's stick with the simple case here where we just have to agree that certain registers contain the return address. And let's also change this uh, so that we actually see that this function can be called, for example, twice. So now this function foo gets called twice. So we should see now foo printed twice. And that's what's happening here. Now, before we think about how to extend this calling convention to support other things like parameters, local variables, and return values, let me show you how this assembly notation can be pimped so that it's more expressive, that it's clear that in this instruction, I'm calling a function also in this instruction and in this last instruction here, I'm returning from a function. And when I return from a function, it's clear that I'm not interested in any return address. So here I don't want to specify a second register. Now in order to support this notation, you just have to provide alternatives here. Uh, first, I just copy this and rename this mnemonic into call. And then for this return instruction, I'm just removing this second operand. And if you do not use a field in this uh, assembly notations, uh, it will be still usable and it will have an initial value of zero. That means if uh, this return alternative is used, uh, this register here is anyway the zero register. So things will still work. We don't have to change the program here, but we have to rebuild the architecture. Of course, it's now also interesting to see in the debugger how we jump to a certain function and how before this jump takes place, the return address will be stored in a certain register and how we then jump back to the correct return address. So let's do that. Let's uh, use the debugger. And here we actually do not have to look at the virtual memory because you also see here at what address a certain instruction is located in memory. Now with the first instruction, we load the destination address into register one. The destination address is the first instruction of function foo. The first instruction is this put C instruction here at address hex 14 in decimal 20. Uh, by the way, you also see that in the debugger, how is the first alternative of this assembly limitations is displayed. So this here is the call instruction and this here is the return instruction. Okay, now this address is stored in register one. Now with the next instruction, we will jump to the function and uh, on returning from the function, we should continue with the next instruction at address eight. So this address should be stored before the uh, jump takes place in register two. So this will change now to this return address. Now we print all these characters and here we jump back to the address in uh, register two. And here we go. Now we return from the function and here again, we store the destination register again in register one. Would actually not be necessary here because the function didn't modify register one. So actually uh, you see that uh, the same value will now be stored here again, but then we just jump again to the function. Now you see that the return address uh, is different. Now it's hex one zero. That's the address of this hold instruction. So after the function returns, the next instru instruction will be the hold instruction. 
And here we jump back to this whole instruction. In this demo, you already saw that some conventions are needed. Uh, the callee needed to know where the return address was stored by the caller. Otherwise, there is no going back. And for extending this so that we also have local variables, parameters, and return values, we now extend this. And we do that by dividing the registers into registers that belong to the caller and registers that belong to the callee. And once we did that, we can use certain parameters for passing, for example, parameters and for receiving return values. And now here we have to think about what is the right ownership, for example, for registers used um, to store parameters. Well, a parameter belongs to the callee, and that means uh, the caller in this case needs to know how many parameters are expected by the callee and what parameter should be in which um, register. So we have to make kind of a contract between uh, these two guys. And for returning a value, uh, we can think of the register that in the end will contain a return value belonging to the caller. And in this case, the callee needs to know uh, what register uh, is expected to contain this return value. And here I will show you in another demo how these two guys uh, can agree on such things. In this demo, I first want to rewrite this Hello World program uh, into a program that consists of a main program uh, calling a function put as maybe twice with two different strings. So let's call this test func test s. And then this code will basically become the put as function uh, after this separator here. So let's use some comments for that function put as. And this function will uh, receive some parameter belonging to the callee. And I will call this uh, param zero. And in general, you can have uh, more than just one param parameter, of course. And uh, here I want to have my main program. So it's um, in this version, not a function because we just have leaf functions and main is not a leaf function. So it's more like uh, programs in Fortran. And this will call function put as. So this code comes later. Uh, up here, I want to write down all these agreements between callee and callee, uh, basically what register belongs to whom with EQ directives. For example, that caller zero is an identifier referring to a register that belongs to the caller. And I will, of course, need a few more. So let's call them caller one, two, and three. And to be here a bit more flexible, I will use here expressions like that. So you will see if I change this later maybe to four, then uh, I have here five, six, seven. And I don't have to change uh, too many things at too many places. Also, it will be kind of nice to have always an identifier referring to the last register that belongs to the caller, something like uh, caller last. And in this case, this will be uh, caller three. So that means if I add uh, more register to the caller, uh, give him uh, more uh, registers, I just have to change this here. And in a similar way, I want to um, assign registers to the callee. So I just copy this five lines. And callee zero. Actually, I also should change this here to callee. Uh, will be uh, computed in a similar way. Callee zero will just be the last register that belongs to the caller plus one. So this is caller last plus one. And then I also just have to change this here. 
Okay, so this will be basically um, specifying how we uh, divide certain um, registers between caller and callee. And um, for the callee, for example, we already see that uh, we want to have this name uh, param zero. There's a more convenient way to express that a certain register belonging to the callee uh, is used as parameter. So this will be an um, additional agreement here. Um, that param zero is just a different name for callee zero. And um, also we can specify here that, for example, the caller will use one register for storing the destination uh, address, the address of a function, and another register for storing the return address. And I don't want to use names like caller zero, um, caller one for that. Uh, I want to have it more expressive. So uh, func header um, will be, uh, for example, caller zero. And the return address will be caller one. Okay, and now we can actually uh, implement this function put as. So a function is a label followed by some code, and the label is just the name of the function, so put as. Then uh, before we were using uh, this register one, uh, identified with adder for storing uh, the address. This is now actually just the parameter that we get. So we just use here param zero to actually already have the address in this uh, register. So we do not have to load um, the address of the string. This needs to be done already in the main program. And this um, register2 was used for storing a character fetched from the memory. So this is basically like a, a local variable, this register2. And for a local variable, we have to use a register that belongs to us. Param0 is actually callee0. We know that from our agreement above. So callee1 could be used for that, not callee0. And that's actually it. Uh, we, of course, do not need uh, a data segment here. The string comes from uh, the main program. And instead of halting the program, we have to jump back. So we have to return to the return address. And that's actually already it. What we also now should consider this is that we sooner or later run into name conflicts if we use uh, labels like here, uh, because other functions might also come up with the idea um, to call a certain label fetch or whatever. And therefore, we just uh, need some kind of naming convention. And that would be that we, for example, use dot name of the function dot and then whatever name we used before. So we change that uh, into this here. And uh, then also this here. And of course, this is no longer uh, a halt uh, instruction that follows this label. So uh, let's call this dot put as return, the label for the return uh, instruction. And then we also jump here not to halt, but to dot put as dot red. Okay. But this uh, is basically it, uh, implementation of this function put as. Now we can uh, implement the main program. This will in the end halt the program. So we can start here with the last instruction. And then here we have to think about um, what uh, we want to print. So here we need actually a data segment. Uh, let's say we want to print two different strings, message zero, uh, might be the hello world string. And then actually I want to change uh, function put as so that in the end also a new line gets printed. We now have this um, convenient instruction for printing uh, character literal. So uh, let's also do that. Before we return, we print a new line. OK, 
Okay, let's make um, actually two strings here for the German string so that we actually see some benefit of using functions. Okay, so this is the data for the main program and now we also need the instructions for the main program and we want to call this function twice and for calling it we also need to store the parameters in some registers in this param0 register. What is the parameter? Well, the address of this first string, for example. So this should be stored in param0. Then we also need to store the uh, address of the function itself. So function put us in some register in the func header register and then we want to call this function. Here we also need the register for the return address. And then we actually want to do this twice. And in the second call we want to print message one. Okay, so that's it. And now the next thing is to fix the bug here. This of course should be a hello. But now this is it. Next thing uh, that we of course want to do is um, um, rewrite these programs for reading in an integer and printing an integer in a way that we have functions for this functionality. So let's go back to here. And here at the bottom, uh, we generate new sections for that. And here I want to have this function for uh, reading in an integer. So this will have a return um, value. And um, let's say um, the caller will call this register belonging to the caller for getting the return value red bell. Then the declaration in this C-like style would be get unsigned integer 64 bit. And actually, if we want to really use um, C declarations here, we also specify here that this put as function in our case does not have a return value. The actual put as function does have. So um, for this get unsigned integer we use the implementation of this program get unsigned int 64 and when we turn this into a function we begin with uh, giving it a label the name of the function, of course. Then uh, this test uh, was used for specifying the destination register. This is now this uh, red well register uh, from the caller. This ch is a local variable or used like a local variable. So this becomes, for example, callee zero. And the labels also should be renamed so that we do not get this name conflict. And again, the convention is to use the function name, uh, first the dot and then the function name. Or my convention is that. Uh, that means I also need to change this label here into dot get underscore uint64 dot read. So the labels now become a bit long but uh, uh, programming in assembly requires some discipline and uh, also sometimes this inconvenient uh, long labels. So this uh, done becomes um, dot get uint64 dot return. 
Right, let's change that. And the halt instruction becomes a return instruction. Return to the return address. Okay, and here I somehow messed up the indent. Okay, and here I forgot to also replace this label to rename it. Okay, but I think that's it. Now I want to test, of course, of uh, this uh, quick and dirty implementation works. So I just call this function after I printed this strings. So, and I also, of course, need to uh, specify that uh, register for, uh, um, of the caller that is used for the return value. So, for example, this register. And now here I want to call this uh, function. So I do not need to pass some parameter. I want to call the function get underscore uint64. And afterwards, I want to uh, somehow check whether uh, this integer was actually um, received. So I just uh, use this as an exit code for now. And uh, if this works, I can also implement this function for printing unsigned integers and then make a more uh, thorough test. Seems to work at least uh, if uh, I can see the exit code as I tapped in the value. So only for um, eight bit uh, unsigned integers. Now the next thing will be the print function for printing unsigned integers. So this is function with return type void or no return type print underscore uint64 and this gets a parameter and here I'm using the program for printing this unsigned integer. So first here the label and we do not need this um, uh, data for testing the implementation and uh, this well is the name of the register which will contain the value that we want to print so this will be param zero and this here then will be just another uh, register uh, for storing the digits so this will be a local variable uh, different from param zero. Uh, recall that this is actually callee zero. So here I'm using callee one. And for this pointer, I'm using callee two. Okay. Now we also have to change this label so that we prevent this uh, name conflict. So with this convention dot function name print uh, underscore u in 64 dot buff so from now on probably no more label and directive or label and instruction in the same line so how do we else use this label also here uh, here and here okay that's it with this label uh, buff. Then the next label is this get digit. So also here this prefix, also here and that's uh, okay. That's okay. Yeah, 
I think uh, that's it. And so the next label in uh, print is this uh, print digit label. So this also gets this prefix. And, um, yeah, that's it. This doesn't look nice here, but I do not have a new line here. Okay, so I think that's it with the labels. Now we also have to modify a bit the implementation, in this case, uh, mostly simplifications. For example, these two instructions here were used for fetching uh, the data into this register well, and this is no longer needed. needed. We already receive it in a register. So shorter code is better code. And this hold instruction, of course, also needs to be changed into a return instruction. So let me go back to the return address. And that's it for this function. Now we go to the main program. And there we, for example, can use um, this code as a template for calling a function with one parameter. The parameter is what we get from here, uh, back as return value. And here currently we do not have a nice assembly notation for copy the content of one register into another. So I just use a add q uh, instruction. Of course, we can uh, make some nice uh, assembly notation for such a frequently used task. So, but now I just uh, add uh, to red val to this register, the zero register, and store this in param zero. And then I want to call print underscore uint64. Okay, that's it. Okay. Of course, a new line at the end uh, after printing this unsigned integer would be nice. Uh, but let's first test a few other things also. Some value where we could not use just the execute to check whether we actually did read it in correctly. And now, before we polish the output, let's polish first the instruction set so that we can just copy one register uh, into another without using this add queue uh, workaround. Um, internally, we can still do it the same way, but um, we can make it more convenient to actually do this. So for this uh, variant uh, of add queue where I'm adding registers, I'm just adding a new alternative um, mnemonic. Uh, I call it move queue. And this time I'm um, adding a register X with the zero register by not specifying here register y. So that means um, the value of y will be zero. So I'm adding again just a zero register to the register um, x and store it in the same destination register. And now I can um, write this more expressive. I no longer need to specify here this um, workaround of the zero register explicitly. Uh, internally, still the same thing happens. This becomes smooth queue, and that's it. Okay, now we have to rebuild the machine. Okay, so and now I want to polish uh, the output. I want to print a new line at the end, so I just hard code this uh, like that. And then I also want to make it a bit easier for you to do the exercise. Uh, they are, you will be asked to ask the user to type in some value for n. So you first print out this string, then you call the function for reading in an integer, then you will compute the factorial and then print out n factorial equals whatever the factorial uh, is so you will have basically two strings one for asking for an input and one for showing uh, the output and i will uh, print the 
result of n plus one. So of course I uh, choose a simpler um, problem for myself than for you. So this here prints n equals, and that's it. And this prints this n plus one now. In between, I want to read in some unsigned integer. So here we store in the return value register, what we get from function get underscore u in 64. And this result I want to uh, use for some computation. In my case, I just want to increment it. Uh, so I want to actually use a variable n for storing the result and the result uh, of this computation will be in this case red val plus one so for that i of course need a new eq directive uh, i have to use a available register for storing this local variable uh, n and I will use here this eq n is equivalent to quarter three. This is actually the last available register in this case and uh, that wouldn't have been sufficient this number of registers I uh, now would have uh, needed to add some registers uh, assign some additional registers to the caller. Okay so after this computation, I want to print the string n plus one equals, and then I want to print uh, the actual result of the computation. So here I want to print the unsigned integer with 64 bits stored in register n. That means here I have to copy this register n to this uh, parameter register, and then I should make this code, of course, a bit nicer. So that it's more readable and then easier to find uh, bugs. Okay, and now we can test this. Okay, so much about polishing the output. Now in this case, it's actually not good that this put as function is always printing a new line in the end. So let's change uh, this implementation uh, to some non-standard uh, behavior that it's not printing a new line always at the end. Okay, I think for the assignment, uh, this is kind of a good template for you guys. Now, um, just fill in the blank instead of adding a one computer factorial. And I think, or I'm sure that you can do this very easily.